We have already talked about some of the Wilkes Street Tunnel's dark past during the American Civil War with the unsolved murder of a young Delaware Army private. Several years after the war, in 1882, a peculiar and unsettling event involving a young married couple and an argument that turned deadly rocked the Tunneltown neighborhood for several months. The conclusion to the dark encounter, however, is not what you'd expect. Twenty-two-year-old James Cliff walked with his young wife Molly McKinney to the Potomac Ferry Company wharf on the morning of August 16, 1882. Mr. Cliff's 16-year-old bride fancied a trip to Washington, D.C. Money was tight for the young couple. Molly had allegedly come up with the funds for a nice trip into the big city. At the time, the couple had only been married for about five months. Three months after they were married, Mr. Cliff was let go from his job as a tinsmith due to poor health draining their cash flow considerably. Although he protested her trip that morning, he insisted on escorting his wife. Mr. Cliff suggested they take a shortcut to the ferry through the Wilkes Street Tunnel. Midway through the tunnel, at his darkest and most concealed point, James slapped his wife and drew a small caliber pistol and proceeded to fire several shots at her. Molly was hit in four places, on her right ear, on her head above her ear, in the fleshy muscle on her right arm, and her left hand. Miss McKinney's screams were heard by several people in the neighborhood, yet nobody seemed to detect foul play at first glance. Two young boys who happened to be walking through the tunnel had visual on the struggle in question. Upon hearing Molly's cries, they approached the helpless woman before being told to turn around and leave by Mr. Cliff, who reportedly fired two shots at them. Molly McKinney emerged from the tunnel moments later, visibly weeping and covered in her own blood. Mr. Cliff followed close behind his wife, carrying himself cool and calm as if the recent burst of violence were merely a lover's quarrel. Mr. Cliff stopped to chat with several parties in attendance nearby, admitting to them that he had in fact shot his wife. So great was the surprise at his action, the article stated, that no one attempted to arrest him. He proceeded to walk casually down Royal Street in the direction of the canal. The gravely wounded Molly McKinney, meanwhile, was brought to her nearby home by a group of women who saw her in distress. After nearly passing out from blood loss, she was brought back to by the helpful women before a doctor arrived to extract what projectiles he could out of her body. The doctor removed the balls from her hand and arm, but waited to remove those in her ear and head until she had, quote, calmed down. The wounds were serious, but not fatal, thankfully. Word of the event spread, and a crowd soon formed around the house of Molly McKinney. Oddly enough, it took a great amount of time before anyone in the vicinity began to search for Mr. Cliff, the husband who had simply walked away from the crime scene so calmly and casually. What kind of man was he, and what possessed him to make an attempt on his wife's life? James Cliff had spent the better part of two months sick with consumption, which made him unable to work. Molly, not one to shy for the finer things in life, asked for fine clothes, food, and companionship, which her husband answered with jealousy and physical and emotional abuse. This was all well documented by those who knew them. Neighbors reported that he was known to whip his wife, yet not in a manner that would suspect further efforts of deeper foul play. His friend said he was possibly insane. Yet in the realm of Gilded Age romance, Mr. Cliff and Miss McKinney had forgivable differences. Molly's habit of seeking lively company made Mr. Cliff insanely jealous, likely the prime motive for his attack. For all intents and purposes, he managed to casually walk away from the city unmolested. James Cliff took to the Washington Road outside the Alexandria jurisdiction, where he waited until evening when he returned back to the city feeling too weak from his illness to move further. He went directly to his sister's house on Duke Street. His sister proceeded to call the police who took him into custody. The Alexandria Gazette reporter met with Mr. Cliff in his jail cell the following morning to speak to him about what had happened. When the reporter arrived, Mr. Cliff was reading the very report on the incident published that morning. He then proceeded to tell his side of the story, correcting the report's ostensible misinformation in a very indifferent manner. Much of the offender's account played out like the article from the previous day. Mr. Cliff insisted that it was his wife's own idea to go to the wharf for the express purpose of borrowing money for a trip to Washington. 
According to Mr. Cliff, she had not secured money for a tryst in the big city quite yet. How she would get that money was up for speculation. The tunnel track, in his eyes, was her idea. He also said that he had a very loving marriage with Molly until he got sick. It was only after this that he said that she, quote, would never stay with a consumptive man, hoping God might paralyze her if she did. He then continued his tale of sorrows for several more lines, regaling the reporter with a litany of jealous notions and suspicions of infidelity. To him, whatever had happened in the previous morning was justified. Meanwhile, down the street in their home, Molly rested from her serious injuries. One of the balls in her ear still lodged firmly in place. Sadly, the article written later that day ended on a somber note indicative of the time period. Quote, Mrs. Cliff, it is understood, does not want her husband punished for his crime and is willing, like a woman, to blame herself entirely for the affair. It was an ominous warning of things to come, if not prophetic. Two months went by before there was a conclusion to the Cliff assault case. In the middle of October 1882, the Commonwealth set out to convict the prisoner James Cliff, who had the intent to maim, disfigure, disable, and kill his wife. Neither party had apparently seen each other since the incident in August, but circumstances that played out would prove that that was highly unlikely. After taking time for the selection of jury, witnesses were called, including Molly McKinney herself. In a shocking turn of events, she refused to testify in court against her husband, giving no reply when asked about the events on the 17th of August. When she finally did speak up later during questioning, she said that, quote, she had nothing to tell and objected to other leading questions that would have assuredly convicted Mr. Cliff. All the prosecutor could get from the witness after several attempts to get her to tell the truth was a smile. The smiling grew infectious and soon laughter was heard in the courtroom. When asked if she had been talked to or influenced before the trial, she responded with a submissive and an audible yes. She then refused to say anything else on the matter of the trial, which forced the prosecutor to send a star witness to jail for contempt of court for the evening. The trial reconvened on the following day, with a witness in a hopefully better position for testimony. She agreed to tell part, but not all, of her story. Whatever she said must not have been compelling, as the end of the trial neared. Other witnesses were examined, playing into the hands of the defense, who asked for a plea of transitory insanity before the jury retired. A verdict was reached in the evening of October 16, 1882. Foreman Joseph Kaufman presented a verdict of not guilty. James Cliff, now a free man, left the court with his wife, quote, arm in arm, as loving as if nothing has ever happened to disturb their domestic relations. Applause could be heard audibly in the courtroom after the verdict was delivered. Such was the time and delicate circumstances that let a jealous man with anger issues get away with some of the worst instances of domestic abuse. It was the unfortunate product of the time period. The vehicle for that violence was eerily enough the Wilk Street Tunnel, which provided Mr. Cliff with the perfect location to strike her in a jealous rage. 